Well, thank you, Hui Ling. Oh, oh. It's, it's always great to have um, students, future professors, be interested in your work and to, it's, and, and to get their insights and their take on what seems important or compelling. So I'm really grateful uh, for your interest uh, in my work. You know, I'm always betwixt and between topics. And, and so this paper is a composite of two themes, as you can see. Um, uh, I, I have a forthcoming collection on worlding cities. Uh, worlding because they are in the process of becoming uh, uh, global. Uh, so I'm, I'm just kind of basically uh, fusing that with, with this other interest uh, in, in, um, on uh, Piet Ater subjects. OK. The skylines of Asian big cities, Beijing, Shanghai, and Singapore, cause profiles of global emergence. This is one of my books that just came out. A mix of metropolitan might and megawatt appeal in the Asian metropolis presents an opportunity to rethink Asian urban forms and their role as the nexus between state and city, and the city and the generation of global values. I argue that the study of contemporary global forms and function um, must be located at the intersection of the nation, the information technology, uh, economy, and an international creative class. Um, all right. The rise of Asian cities as centers of spectacle and speculation challenges conventional notions about a global city as the site of universal human rights. I argue that the ambitious Asian city is a site for realizing national interests through the coordination of flows of global knowledge, actors, and values. As centers of spectacle, Asian megacities become staging ground for the manipulation of international sign values and vie with each other in projecting the nation's global vision. As sites of speculation, ambitious cities uh, recruit an international knowledge class whose presence engenders diverse material and symbolic values. But while Piet Ater subjects contribute to the prestige and wealth of the worlding city, they also embody the denationalized character of capitalism. So poised between staying and going, the knowledge nomad performs a transfer of value that shapes the hypermetropolis as both a national space and a site of exception to citizenship. So that's the outline. Perspectives on globalization and urban growth frame the big city as a political space where the gap between the migrants and rights can be closed. Saskia Sassen conceptualizes the global city as a site for internationalizing, uh, internalizing norms and practices that uphold the human rights regime. As a global center of finance and cosmopolitan culture, she argues, New York City enacts a denationalization of the nation, producing a city-derived citizenship that is disarticulated from the home country. The city has an ensemble of global institutions and is, after all, host to the United Nations. Here, she claims, immigrants realize their human rights by claiming entitlements as citizens of the city, if not of the United States. Sassen's view finds an echo in Yasmin Soysel's argument that Turkish migrants in Germany can claim limited benefits and civil rights. A claim, she says, amounts to what a partial or post-national citizenship. Finally, an even more sweeping assertion sees the city as a site of a counter-empire. Michael Hart and Antonio Negri argue that in a world transformed into a capitalist empire, the mobile multitude can assemble in the great city to demand what they call global citizenship. These different views are united in defining the big city as a universal space for the actualization of global human rights. But the tendency to view the city as a placeless universal space ignores the political investments of the nation state in which the city is embedded. There's also the suggestion that the transition of migrants in the city from non-citizenship to citizenship status is an inevitable process. Um, city authorities are presented as ever ready to embrace a universal spirit by extending rights to in, an indiscriminate assortment of migrants. 
Now, clearly, the Weberian notion of the European city as an autonomous political entity, independent of signorial authority, overly influences the analysis of contemporary cities. Indeed, while the city in Europe and North America continues to be viewed as a site for protecting human rights, there is, I suggest, an excess in the production of, of other global values beyond human rights. For instance, New York City, uh, although it's less uh, preening these days, New York is a city where the affluent that is, uh, is squeezing out the middle classes, young professionals, and everyday workers, instead of regretting such a development, for instance, Mayor Blo Bloomberg has boasted that his city is a luxury product. In contradiction to Bloomberg's representation, I argue, the desirable residents in Asia's emerging cities are less the rich and famous and more the educated and talented, that is, the creators of intellectual and speculative values. Oh, well, I'm, run, I'm sort of losing track of my phone. Let me see, which file is this one? Oh, all right. The focus on a big city as a denationalized space tends to downplay the role of the state in its constitution. There is also a popular view that global cities are nodes performing important functions for the global political economy, as presented in Saskia Sassen's famous The Global City. In contrast to these perspectives, I emphasize the city as a state space uh, that is not autonomous of the state, but is a zone of exception in the na national terrain. The a East Asian metropolis is profoundly national, um, an accepted space for exper experimentations in urban form and rule. It is also a, 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 a national site of enormous, um, enormous state investments and, ex and challenges, responses to challenges from the global risk society. Paul Rabinow has argued that French urban planners tested their urban designs in colonial Morocco before repatriating them to metropolitan France. Today, emerging Asian countries are, exper city, countries are experimenting with and testing urban forms uh, in these key cities that are then later distributed in the hinterland. So contrary to the view that cities serve the global system but not the nation, I argue that the great metropolis is a space of exception and what I have elsewhere called graduated sovereignty, a key site for testing new urban forms, techniques for managing populations, and, a, the kind of, and staging the kind of cultural ferment that can sit with the national image itself. It is not possible to think about contemporary cities without considering global condi conditions of uncertainty. In his concept of reflexive modernization, Oleg Beck notes, unknown threats cannot depend on optimized industrial responses, but de demand an epistemic and social construction of probabilities from the external dynamic conditions of dynamism and uncertainty. The modern attitude then, working with probable outcomes, has a prof at its core a profound sense uh, uh, has a profound core of calculation and risk strategy. Where else in the post 9/11 era but a great city can we find reflexive calculations about space, confronting the unexpected and shaping soaring visions of the future? In, in emerging Asia, it is necessary to think about a great city as a site of the nation's self-experimentation in the art of controlling the future. In this sense, I consider the great Asian city as an experimental system. Thus, contrary to the view of the city as a naturalized human ecology proposed by the Chicago School of Sociology, Asian cities must be viewed as constituted by different logics of this experiment. Uh, the, the, and, and, and this is, the experiment, you know, I would argue, involves various combinations of national power, markets, and, and global values. Experimental systems can be very productive for solving some kind of questions, but not others, but they acquire a sort of momentum that takes the experiment in unpredicted directions. So urban experiments articulate between national ambitions, 